Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Stay Healthy Knoxville podcast, brought to you by Simply Physio, aimed at helping you live an enjoyable, fit, and healthy life in and around our community of Knoxville, Tennessee. And now, here is your host, Dr. John Mark Chesney. Hey guys, welcome to the show today. I'm excited to have today on the show uh, Daniel Roche with Perfect Water. He is a local expert on water health and ways to improve the quality of your life by improving your water. He's an account manager at Perfect Water, which is a company that specializes in water purification for Tennessee families. Uh, They started here in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they help you take control of your water. Uh, They also design and install rainwater harvesting systems. We'll be focusing uh, mainly on water purification side of things today here in the episode. So questions that we'll be answering regarding uh, how good is your current water supply, why you may want a pure water in your home, health concerns and quality of life issues regarding the quality of your tap water. We'll be uh, discussing the fluoride debates, uh, water filtration options such as Brita, Berkey bottled water versus home water purification systems and all things water. So Daniel, uh, welcome to Stay Healthy Knoxville. Sean Mark, it's great to be here. Well, yeah, well, we love to start the show with hearing a little bit of your backstory. So I know a little bit about Daniel. Daniel's, um, we're not really related, um, but um, both of, um, we have, a, both have larger families. Now, um, Daniel's is, is, I think, 33% larger than mine. What, you guys have <laughs> nine, nine kids? Nine kids, yep. Okay, so I'm one of six, he's one of nine. What number are you, Daniel? I'm seven. Seven. So okay. e- easier end of that spectrum. So um, I'm number two of six, but um, but yeah, it's um, so yeah, he's he's one of nine. But uh, so his uh, sister, my brother, uh, are married, and so we're not really related, but there's some sort of family bond, I guess. Indeed. So, um, but yeah, glad to have you uh, here on on the show. And uh, what I know some of your backstory, but you know, of course, our listeners don't. So I'd love to hear about how. You got started in uh, water quality, um, and I know it's a family affair, so I guess the question is how your family really got started in water um, quality and where that's brought you up to today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have been involved in the water purification, filtration, rainwater harvesting, all things water quality and availability industry um, for quite a few years. My dad got started back in the 80s. Um, Knoxville native, but got started up in Akron, Ohio. My mom was finishing up at Kent State, and he was just looking for a job, and there was an opening at a water treatment dealer, and so got involved there, was up there for about 10 years, and then in the 90s, um, came down here and started Perfect Water Up in 97. And so uh, I got into the company um, right out of high school. I was debating between uh, going to a trade school and getting involved with the company. And um, it became pretty clear uh, in just a lot of prayerful consideration on what I wanted to pursue. It was continuing the legacy of helping people love their water um, and improving the quality of life through that. So um, got involved right out of high school, and I'll be at six years uh, in the company a little later this year. All right. Well, um, it is kind of a family affair, right? Yeah, it is. So I, um, I'm involved, obviously, and of, of the nine, everyone has, you know, had summer jobs during high school um, with the company and, and various uh, siblings have had stints working with the company. Um, right now, really, the core group is my older brother, Jacques. Um, he does installations. And then I've got a younger brother who helps out in marketing. And then um, I interface with clients who are interested in, in hearing more about the products. And then obviously uh, dad is still uh, quite involved as well. And we're hoping to be able to help him retire out of it uh, eventually and, and take the reins. All right. Nice. Well, um, so yeah, so you, uh, Perfect Water, your guys' company is, has been around, you said started in the 87. 97. 97. 97. Okay. So we're 23 years in February of this year. Okay. Yeah, just even interested in how that has evolved the company from the early days to where it is now. Yeah. Like, has that has there been, whether it be like technology advances or you said your father was even in it before starting his own company. 
Yeah. The history of like water purification. Sure. Absolutely. Well, definitely in, in terms of technology, there have been a lot of advancements and improvements in water filtration technology, I guess, with any industry in the last 23 years. Um, so a lot of people have connotations associated with water filters from when they were a kid or whatnot. And uh, a lot of problems that obviously were faced in the industry have been solved largely in the last 23 years. So um, absolutely, the the products that we've sold as a company, we're an independent dealer, meaning we're not a, a franchise company with one specific manufacturer of equipment that we work with. Mm-hmm. And so we are able to stay pretty abreast, we feel, to new technologies coming out. And we have really helped bring into uh, homes newer technologies that maybe some big franchise companies are, aren't able to tap into. So in terms of technology, yeah, we've seen a lot of changes over the last 20 years. And I can say that with some, you know, you've only been in it six years, but uh, through high school, obviously, um, I've got more years than, than six. So, uh, and then, yeah, as, as far as Perfect Water as a company, I started out with my dad in a, a van and that was the total <laughs> company. And um, down by the river? Down by, yeah. <laughs> And so uh, we still have a lot of those old clients who remember it as Dennis and, and bringing along one of the boys to help, you know, crawl in the crawl space and sweat pipe um, to uh, now having um, employees and installers and technicians that are um, obviously on board just to help keep up with the, the larger customer base now. Sure. Well, um, with the whole, even like the history interested in, in water purification, has, has that been around a long, long time or is it, is it more something that's like, there's a need yeah. for that's changed based on the current environment or is the environment different sure. now than what it was before? Well, yeah, obviously, you know, water filtration in some form or another has been around for a long, long time, whether it was, you know, ancients pouring water through a bucket of sand and saying, oh, wow, it's coming out cleaner on the other side. But um, absolutely, I think the modern day problems we're trying to address with a lot of municipal water, there are just a vast number of impurities and contaminants that probably were not being dealt with 50 years ago, certainly not 100 years ago, just in terms of um, industrial chemicals that have made their ways into the aquifers and up into the rivers and into the intakes that the cities are pulling in for sending out to the um, various districts. So I think certainly um, there are many more chemical impurities we're dealing with. Certainly also pharmaceuticals is an emerging um, topic of concern in the industry, uh, even over just the last 10 years, uh, identified both by EPA and independent laboratories saying, wow, this is actually something we need to figure out just because so many more people are on pharmaceuticals now and those either, you know, pills being dumped on the toilet or uh, passing through, you know, after being consumed and getting into the wastewater and out into the rivers. uh, It's definitely an area that's changed in the water filtration purification world that past generations didn't have to. It's interesting. So they're finding evidences of pharmaceutical influences in the water, you're saying? Absolutely. Okay. And I imagine Tennessee, I mean, Tennessee is one of the worst states with the number of prescription medications per, you know, capita or per per individual out of, you know, just the United States is one of the worst. Do you have an idea of even just the state of Tennessee or the region's water compared to maybe other regions? Like, is, is there a vast difference? I don't know in terms of the, the pharmaceutical use and what the concentrations are. I'm not as familiar with that. Mm-hmm. I do know for most of East Tennessee, um, unlike other areas in the country, we are mostly supplied by surface water intakes, meaning there's a body of water, whether it's a river, a lake, a stream, whatever, that's where we're dropping our intake. So when you have a surface water intake, and a nearby city. Surface here. versus... Surface versus spring. a well. Okay. Um, there are, are cities that are serviced by deep wells and they're pumping it out of the ground. Or New York City, for example, they've got glacier melt water coming down. And so uh, while it is a surface water intake, it's very different than a lot of the ones around here where we have city right next to a river. And so, you know, we draw it in from that river. Wastewater treatment plant 
puts it right back in that You're river. You're talking about the Tennessee River? Tennessee River, yeah, Fort Loudon. <laughs> as far as local East Tennesseans here uh, in Knoxville, that's where the vast majority of the water source from. water is, is pulled from. So I guess I would just say, I'm sorry, I kind of got on a tangent there. East Tennessee, in the concern of our pharmaceuticals getting in the water, it is more so a concern than other areas because we have kind of a loop system of putting our wastewater back into the same body of water that we pull our product water from. Okay. Interesting. So yeah, you mentioned like different sources of water and, you know, it's kind of something that probably a lot of our guests or, you know, myself included, don't really think about Mm. like we just turn on the faucet, right? Yeah. (laughs) And there's water and we flush the toilet and there's water and it's just, um, you know, fill up a cup of water and don't really think about the process that goes into like where this water came from or that it's even, you know, come from, the Tennessee river. And, um, I was down in Chattanooga, um, before coming back up here to Knoxville. And I don't know if there's a big difference. Uh, I don't know what Chattanooga's water is on, but I noticed, um, one of our, our dishes, um, in Chattanooga, like, um, we didn't have any, uh, you know, we had a Brita, we had kind of filtration system, but we didn't have anything else in the house. And overall, you know, our, our dishes, you know, came out clean. When we moved back up here, here to Knoxville about two years ago, you know, using the same detergent, we first had an old dishwasher and we upgraded to the same, you know, a, a, a nice dishwasher. And we were having this film like mm. on the dishes and it was not on the dishes in Chattanooga, but yet up here in Knoxville, we're like, what in the world? Like, why are our dishes so dirty? Do you have an idea of what, what that, the difference? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, you pull a glass out of the dishwasher and it looks hazy, foggy, not totally crystal clear. You pull crystal out, you know, crystal wear, and it's, it's even more apparent. What that is um, in East Tennessee and in most water districts in the country, um, it's hard water, so it is dissolved limestone, um, mostly, is where that is introduced into water, and it's calcium and magnesium that make that up, um, water hardness, and so when you see that kind of hazy buildup either on your dishes where you say it doesn't look like it's getting clean, or mm-hmm. your your dishware, it's spotty, wash a car with it, and it leaves the, the little white spots all over it. Any of that is water hardness, the scale you see on the, the shower head um, building up. So it's basically, easiest way to think of it is dissolved rock that when exposed to oxygen and heat precipitates and is seen dried onto your dishes and um, shower heads, things like that. Okay, so that's more of a sign of hard hard water. You have that residue. That's correct. In terms of what you can visibly see and saying, is this water clean for municipal water? You know, you talk about well water. There's a lot of other factors of aesthetics of, man, my things are turning orange or black or whatever it is. But when you're talking about municipal water for problems that can be just viewed, um, it's water hardness is, is 100% that. So, you know, the other problems, chemicals, inorganics, organic impurities, all of those things, you're never going to see them but it does show up pretty visibly with hardness. Now, technically, is hard water unhealthy water? Yeah, so consuming hard water, no. It's it's not going to be adverse to your health. It's got calcium and magnesium. And so while it's not going to add much in terms of mineral benefit to your body, and I can go into you know that in a little more depth, um, but more direct to your question, no, hardness isn't going to be health-wise damaging to drink. Mm-hmm. It is it rears its ugly head in damaging appliances and fixtures and faucets and dishware. Uh, it very much so shows up in hot water tanks or tankless heaters um, where the water is very hot and it will build up. Uh, the Battelle Research Institute uh, is an independent laboratory, as is S&D Laboratories. You can look up their studies They did very comprehensive studies on water hardness in the home and found that by installing a water softener to pull out all that dissolved rock, you can allow your water heater to perform at factory efficiency for 15 years um, because the heating element is not getting coated over with that same scale that you see. You pull your dish from the dishwasher, you see that scale? That is amplified exponentially on a heating element because it's so hot 
that it just causes all of that hardness to build up on it. So mm. uh, I kind of went on a tangent there, but no, it's not going to hurt you, uh, but it does have other adverse effects in the home. Gotcha. Even on the, uh, the topic of like hard versus soft water, I'm, uh, I'm sure others have you know experienced whether, you know, taking a shower in, you know, different cities, hotels, and sometimes like where, hey, the soap's not coming off yes. of me. <laughs> is that a sign of soft water? Is that a sign of hard water? What's, what's going on there? Absolutely. And that is one of the top questions that we get, especially folks north of Mason-Dixon line where everybody's got a water softener coming out from Florida or Texas. They say, I just don't want to feel like I can't get the soap off. So a couple points to that. When you are dealing with dissolved rock in your water and you go to shampoo your hair and soap up in the shower, you feel like you've gotten all the soap off because you rub your hands together and they're not slick. The problem is you're actually not getting the soaps rinsed out, and that's why you don't feel slick, because a human should feel slick in the shower when their natural skin oils aren't getting packed out by soap not fully getting rinsed out of their pores. And so it's a chemical reaction of positively charged calcium magnesium and negatively charged soaps, and it makes it very difficult to fully get those rinsed out. And so people are used to this feeling of, oh, I'm, I don't have soap on me because I'm not slick. And so when you switch to soft water and you feel slick all of a sudden, you've got all these suds going on in your hair. Um, it's just a mental switch you've got to make to say, this is how I should feel slick. I know the soap is actually fully rinsed off now. Um, and most people a month into having a water softener don't want to go back because they realize, man, my skin and hair just feels so, so much better. And they've gotten used to, I should feel slick in the shower. This is great. So now, the second point on that is when water is softened without being pretreated with chlorine removal, it can feel a little slimy. Um, and so that's something a lot of people are used to maybe in a hotel where they say, man, I just did not, not like the way that felt. So often a hotel will soften the water without removing the chlorine and you will feel kind of more slimy. And so uh, for any softening done in a home, the chlorine is removed and then the water softened and it feels very slick as you should feel. Gotcha. So the soap is actually getting rinsed off and there's a few little fun tricks you can do to, to test that. It's kind of a little gimmicky, but I'm just going to mention them very quickly. Um, you we know, like you, tricks. The tricks are fun. You take hard water and soft water and you get them both soaped up or you, you, you soap up your hands and you wash one under the hard water, one under the soft water. Rinse for you know three seconds. Okay, take them out. Which one feels like it's got soap on it? Uh, definitely the one I rinsed in soft water. It feels sure. like it's just lathered in soap. Okay, and the hard water? No, it feels like I rinsed it all off. It, it's great. All right, air dry your hands. And it's a little gross. Again, I don't do this to customers, but it's just an old industry trick. <laughs> then just lick your palm, and you can taste the soap on the one you said, oh, I've got it all off here on the, the hard water side and not on the soft So. Uh, anyways, just to emphasize that point that you are actually getting it rinsed off better than in hard water. Sure. And I mean, I expect if somebody has hard water and taking a shower and, and they're not getting all the soap off of their skin, like that can have an effect on their skin health. Absolutely. Um, you know, if you, if you take up a, an average home, and you think about all the areas that water is used. Certainly, obviously, showers, baths. Also, laundry, though. So that same concept of not fully getting the soaps rinsed out takes place in laundry also. So, you know, a typical day, you, you wake up and you've just spent the night in between two sheets that haven't fully gotten the soaps rinsed out. You go take a shower, and you're not fully getting the soaps rinsed out of your, your hair and your skin because of the the hardness, you'll get dressed in clothes that have gone through that same washer and not been fully rinsed out. And you wonder why, gosh, why don't I always buy in lotion and cream rinses and I'm dry and itchy. Um, and so we have had so many stories from customers who, you know, their whole lives they've dealt with dried cracked knuckles or just dry itchy skin. And um, softeners have very often helped, if not totally eliminate the problem, 
improve it considerably. So certainly that's the biggest benefit to a softener is skin and hair health because you're not dealing with that kind of root issue everyone's trying to. We say people are buying softeners anyway with expensive shampoo, conditioner, cream rinses, lotions, all these things to kind of combat the symptoms uh, where in a lot of cases you can go straight to the cause of hardness, get that out, and then you're not dealing with the dryness. Sure. And are you seeing the you know benefit with other skin conditions like eczema or psoriasis or some of those others, even in as far as having a softener with water? Eczema, uh, certainly we have people call in and after installation of a softener, they have great results with eczema and soft water. So obviously I can't say, yeah, this is a Cure for eczema, but it, sure. it certainly helps. And I say that just from so many stories back from customers who say, gosh, before softener, I was dealing with all this. And then uh, afterwards, a lot of improvement. Right. With the topic of softeners and hardeners, is it an issue with getting like, let's say, you know, the soap off is that an individual doesn't have the sense that the soap is still there and they just need to spend more time scrubbing it? Or is the water itself has a barrier of actually getting the soap off. Yeah, you could eventually get it washed off. Uh, sure. The problem is it takes a lot longer. And so when you've got hard water, you feel, oh gosh, yeah, I'm, I'm sufficiently rinsed now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can move on. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's not something that you'll just constantly have it, but it is because of the chemical reaction, again, of the soaps with, you've got this positively charged rock um, in the water that, that, causes it to be much more difficult to get rinsed out. Gotcha. Besides water, um, hardness and softness, what other concerns might somebody have about, you know, the local water source as far as like what's in the water or even um, you could tell us on like, what is the process, you know, if we have city water that the city goes through to purify the water and what's left in the water that might be of concern for somebody? Yes. So when you turn on your tap, most people don't think, where does this come from? And we are obviously so blessed to live in a country that we can say that. No one's hauling water up from the river. I'm still a little bit like um, on nerve thinking that it's coming from like the Tennessee water. You know, the Tennessee (laughs) River is like, oh man, like I would not just drink, you know, the the Tennessee River. I wouldn't swim in it, much less (laughs) drink it. Well, absolutely. So here's the process of where it comes from. And I just want to make the quick point of there are a lot more pieces of information that are left out with that thought. And it can be very detrimental for health and just quality of life. And so let me just say our local municipal districts do a fantastic job of supplying plenty of water. We walk up to the faucet, we got water, great pressure. They send out the the letter every year saying they met their regulations, check. What we look at is the regulations they're held to and all of the regulations that are admitted saying we'd like to regulate these, but we just can't right now because it's so expensive. So I'll touch on that as soon as I kind of explain where does it come from? You turn on your tap, what's the process has gone through. So for surface water intakes, which is again, most of Tennessee is surface water intakes. Water is drawn in from the river, Tennessee River, French Broad, Douglas Lake, Cherokee Lake, Fort Loudon, wherever it's coming from. It's pulled into the treatment plant and it is put through a process called flocculation in which, yeah, (laughs) in which, you know, you take a a bucket full of water right out of the Tennessee river and it's going to be discolored and brown and gross, especially after a big rain and, you know, it looks just like chocolate. (laughs) Um, So what flocculation does is basically causes all that sediment that keeps water from being clear to coagulate together. And then it moves into a sedimentation phase where the sediment that's been clumped together to be much heavier because of flocculation, it will fall out to the bottom. And then you've got a product where it looks clear. So um, the next step is they've got to get it free of bacteria because obviously it's riddled with coliform, E. coli, all variety of pathogenic bacteria. And so it is hit with a very heavy dose of chlorine and then, so chlorine kills the bacteria. That's sorry, the purpose yes. of chlorine. The purpose of chlorine is 100%. It's in there to kill the bacteria. And that's really the city's prime objective is you don't want anyone taking a glass of water Dying. and, <laughs> yes, <laughs> getting cholera. So um, 
they hit it with a very large dose, which they need because there's a lot of bacteria and, um, you know, they're legally allowed up to four parts per million. Just to give a little quick context on that, swimming pools can't exceed three parts per million. So the level of chlorine can be pretty, pretty high. So outside of putting in some scale inhibitors and corrosion inhibitors, which are chemicals they add to keep the water pipes from deteriorating, mm-hmm. that was pretty much the whole process for a long time. What started happening here and in most areas in the country is byproducts from having added the chlorine started being formed. So added all this chlorine, it started reacting with different organic material in the water and created disinfecting byproducts. So trihalomethane was probably the the most uh, known uh, byproduct. There were five or six other ones and they were found to be carcinogenic and they said, oh gosh, okay, we've got to deal with the byproducts because we have to add the chlorine because we got to get it bacteria safe. But now we've got to deal with these byproducts. So what they found is by adding ammonia, they're able to create another uh, disinfectant that's called chloramine and that will kill the byproducts from the chlorine. One interesting note uh, and quite alarming uh, in my opinion is you can go on EPA's website and EPA is the body that regulates all 50,000 water districts in the U.S. And they'll say, we've not yet done the research on if there are byproducts from the chloramine chemical. So uh, there's quite a bit of gray area there. And, you know, adding that, that chloramine, that's the last step. From there, it is pumped up to water towers you see all over town. And then when you turn on your faucet, you're essentially draining out a water tower into your house. So just to give some perspective on sure, it's not coming from a, a magical well of great water. And if you ever ground. tasted tap water, not that you would think it is, mm-hmm. but it, it's coming from those water towers. <clears throat> sure. Awesome. Well, um, we're going to take uh, the quick break. And uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about, you know, the states now kind of where we've paused is this is the water that probably most of our listeners have unless they have, you know, some sort of system. We're going to talk about, you know, what is it that a water filtration system does and what does it remove? What's the difference between a house filtration system versus a Brita bottle water, Berkey, get into some of uh, the reverse osmosis. What does that mean? And any other um, myths or even just contaminants that people should be concerned about just in their top water. So we'll take a quick break. Um, you uh, will hear a word from our sponsor. Stay Healthy Knoxville is sponsored by Simply Physio, a physio clinic that equips and empowers you to live your life to the fullest so that you can enjoy the things you love to do and be the person you are made to be. Simply Physio specializes in helping people get back to a healthy and active lifestyle, living free from pain and medication and avoiding unnecessary surgery. Stay tuned until the end of the episode to receive a special gift from Simply Physio and enjoy listening to the rest of the episode. Welcome back, guys. We're talking about water and getting into um, just what's in our water and why should we be concerned. And the more I'm, you know, working just the healthcare field, the more I, you know, recognize that uh, what we put in our bodies has an effect on our health. And oftentimes, you know, the the media industry, you know, I feel like it's focused on food and nutrition and you know how where the food source from and water maybe doesn't quite get the the full level of steam that it should. So um, I'm glad we're um, continuing to bring up this topic so that just we're well aware, right, of of what's actually going on and um, so that we can make the best decision, you know, for um, ourselves, for our families on, you know, what process we should take. But Daniel, tell us some, um, so from where we left off, we understand like how we get our water, but what else is, is in our water? Are there other things that we should be concerned about in our, in our water here in Knoxville? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when you look at municipal water, as I said earlier, you get the, the note by law from your water district every year saying, check, check, check. We've met the standard. You've got quote unquote safe water for use in your home. Your tap water is great. Again, this is no hit on the municipal district. They're doing their job. But what we do as water treatment professionals, water purification professionals, people who are really concerned with just what you said, uh, really 
kind of shining a light on the blind spot a lot of people have, which is their water. You know, considering human body is comprised so much of water, and if you're not treating it beforehand, then you're treating it in your body. Your sure. body's having to process these things. So um, what we look to do is really just educate people on here are the remaining impurities, contaminants, concerns that when you turn on your faucet and it's draining down that water tower, what are you dealing with? So the standard that all 50,000 municipal districts in the United States are regulated under comes from the EPA. I mentioned that earlier. The document that they are required to observe and meet is called the I say, quote unquote, but it's just called the Safe Drinking Water Act. You can look it up. Uh, it's available. So what this document has is 93. It's a table with 93 different contaminants. And these range from heavy metals to bacteria to disinfecting byproducts, which I mentioned earlier, uh, to organic chemicals. Basically, it is a list that was compiled mostly back in the 60s and said, okay, this is the standard. We have to monitor for these. If these are dealt with, let's send it on. It's safe. When you look at this document, there are several columns. One of them is called the maximum contaminant level. So say you've got lead, mercury, arsenic, um, trihalomethane. In almost every case of these 93, the maximum contaminant level does allow for a certain amount to come through. And that number has not been consistent from the start. They were kind of just put in arbitrarily. This is probably healthy for most humans, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, of course, everyone reacts differently to different impurities and more scientific research has come out. And so most of those have been lowered since the original number. So you've got the maximum allowable level. And then on a column a couple over, you've got the public health goal. And in almost every case, the public health goal is zero. Mm -hmm. So if you just look at that, you say, do I want this arbitrary maximum level for my home or do I want to go ahead and get to zero? So the other list that I think is pretty revealing from uh, the EPA is, and, and much more concerning, is called the contaminant candidate list. And so uh, it is a list of problems in water that they want to deal with, but currently have not been able to do the bureaucracy that's required and push the cost down to all of these municipal districts. This list is called the contaminant candidate list. So there's several hundred and it's constantly evolving and growing contaminants. So they say, man, these are showing up in water now, pesticides, herbicides, industrial waste, uh, pharmaceuticals are all over that list. Um, and right now it's just being compiled and they're saying someday we'd like to be able to figure out how we can, we can regulate this, but it's just unfeasible right now. First Utility District is a, a local water district in Knoxville, serves a lot of the Farragut, West Knoxville area. In 2017, they sold 4 billion gallons of water to their customers. Far less than 1% of that is actually consumed by humans. It's mm -hmm. used in industrial facilities. It's flushed on the toilet. It's showered in. And so the idea of... First utility being told, hey, next year you got to take this 4 billion gallons of water and really make it where it's great for humans to consume. Because, sure. you know, humans are made so much out of water and they react so differently to all these impurities. We need it to be really pure. It's just never going to work. We'll be spending thousands of dollars a month on our water bill just for first utility to have the infrastructure in place to get to that point. So Especially that's you're just using that to water your car or it, to wash your car, right? You don't need. Indeed, yeah. It. When you're sending the majority of it down the drain, it mm -hmm. it doesn't make financial sense. It doesn't make common sense. So that's an area where um, perfect water and water purification professionals come in and they say, let us be a final barrier in your home and we will get your water up to the standard that you'd like for you and your family, both for health and for quality of life. Beverages taste better, soups taste better. Um, anything you're dealing with water is going to be better, both on a drinking water level and then on a whole house level um, as well. So uh, to your question, I got on a roll there. Um, my question was. Well, it was along the lines of what other contaminants are we are we having to sure. deal with when we turn on the tap? And so 
um, kind of oh, on there's a, a lot <laughs> on a backing it up with it. So it's not just Daniel, the water, you know, purification guy telling you um, it's, it's admitted. It's a known thing in governmental bodies. There's legislation that has been attempted to be passed in several areas calling for final barrier. So they're saying, let's just acknowledge the city can only do so much. Let's just get a certain base level that we're sending out to the masses and let people be responsible for getting it to a drinking water level. So that's where we come in. Gotcha. So yeah, so it's um, uh, at least obvious to me and probably many of our listeners, like, you know, water health is something that, you know, we should at least take into consideration, right? So there's a number of different options out there, you know, on the market. And we're probably growing up with a Brita filter. They were probably one of the first ones on the market with, you know, just a very simple buy the pitcher and get the water filter and try to replace it when the timer goes off. And, you know, you got um, Berkey and even, you know, bottled water you can purchase at the store. So what's the difference between, you know, having that strategy using uh, something like that versus a home filtration system? I will kind of answer that breaking those two out. So a Britty, uh, a Brita rather, <laughs> Britty, uh, a Brita, a Berkey, um, any of those other kind of countertop filters you could get. Uh, I'll answer that one way and then bottled water a, a separate way. So Brita, Berkey, all of those pure, P-U-R, whatever, um, they do a great job of raising market awareness. But in terms of what they're providing in filtration, it truly is filtration. It's not purification. So uh, they pass the water through activated carbon, very similar to what you have in a standard refrigerator filter. And so, yeah, you're pulling out the chlorine and the chloramines, and so it tastes significantly better. You say, man, I've gotten this water cleaned up. Filtered. Filtered, yes. So what you don't know is that you have left untouched all inorganic contamination. And so that is your heavy metals, pharmaceuticals, fluoride, any of these other items that I've, I've recently gone through the list sure. of problems you're dealing with. So it is an effective filtration method that if you're using it to shower in, that's great because you're pulling out the chlorine and you're not absorbing that through your skin. But for a Berkey and a Brita and these countertop ones that are saying, hey, pour this through the filter and drink it worry-free, um, it leaves out a very large concerning block of impurities called inorganics, which they just simply can't filter to. Even the best Berkey Brita filter is only going to filter down to 0.1 microns. Um, and so what we look to do when you say, well, how can I improve that, get that better, is um, reverse osmosis. And that's, and that's the difference between filtration and purification. That's one of the, is that, I mean, is that the difference? That is the difference. Okay. So you hear filtration, that is either filtering out sediment or, which is just, you know, grit in the water or pulling out chemicals such as activated carbon. Purification is what's going to get everything else out of your water and really provide you with peace of mind that I'm drinking this and I'm not dealing with anything of concern because it's going to filter down to point zero zero one microns, um, which is extremely, extremely small. Um, and so that's extremely, pure- extremely, <laughs> extremely, extremely small. Yes. <laughs> so that's purification. Um, and it's, it's really apples and oranges to just passing it through a, a carbon filter to bust out, you know, I'll admit you pass it through a, a Brita and it tastes better, but, um, from a, a health perspective and, um, and even a taste perspective, purification is is superior and that would be like a technology like reverse osmosis or electronic deionization something like that is that um an alternative to reverse osmosis are there a few different kind of ways to go yeah it it probably will become more so um moving forward as it's kind of an emerging technology for now reverse osmosis is definitely the the standard Gold standard yeah yes. um, so reverse osmosis um, in a home purification system right um, not filtration system but purification system 
So it's taking all this out. Is there any concern that it's taking out some things that are maybe good for you um, or things that would be helpful to remain in the water? I know one in particular, um, fluoride, um, right? Um, yes. And there may be others probably that you could tell us about that, you know, would there be any other minerals that could have some health benefit that we're losing potentially in a um, water purified state? Yeah, absolutely. So the fluoride question is obviously one that is somewhat divisive depending on who you talk to. Um, uh, so our perspective as a water purification company interested in helping people to have improved health and quality of life through extremely high quality of water and through many conversations with individuals in the dental field is that we can purify the fluoride out so you're not consuming it. And if you need to have it for your dental health or um, anywhere else that you can get that through a prescription means and not through a fairly unscientific method of let's dose the water with this much and it's mixed in there with everything else coming from from the, the city water. So the fluoride question being, should it be in the water? Um, Our perspective is, Certainly not, because if you leave the fluoride in the water, you have to leave also all of the other inorganic impurities. And so it's better to filter it all out, and you're starting with a clean slate. If you feel for your personal health that fluoride is something you need to to work into it, then get it a different way, not through the water. Sure. Um, And, you know, you can look up how fluoride came to be in city water, and it was kind of a clever way that the DuPont Corporation found a way to offload this industrial waste they had and sell it to municipal districts to add to water. So as a kind of interesting side note, Mm. that's how it, it came about. But um, certainly we say, get it, get it filtered out along with all the other impurities you want, regardless of what your opinion on fluoride is from just a personal health perspective. If you want fluoride, reintroduce it in a more controlled way. Gotcha. And what about any other, like, maybe minerals in the water? A a big question that people ask is, hey, I need minerals, um, so should I be pulling those out of my water? Um, There are many studies uh, that have been done regarding what health benefit do the minerals in water have, and all of their findings are none an extraordinarily minimal amount of benefit. And the reason is, one, you start off with just a very small amount anyways. So calcium magnesium, according to the World Health Organization, uh, they had a big convention in Rome in 2003, and this was a big hot topic of that convention, was is water a legitimate way to get minerals into your diet? And across the board, their finding was, Calcium magnesium would have the most benefit, but even still, it's such an insignificant amount that's coming through compared to food and other supplements, ways you can get those minerals. And the tiny amount that is in the water, the bioavailability of it is so, so small. So your body's ability to process, absorb this, it. yeah, to absorb this calcium and magnesium um, is so small that that small amount you were starting with becomes even less significant because the majority of it's just passing right through your body. And, and, um, so is that different for, um, mineral water? Mineral water is definitely a, uh, kind of another hot topic and, uh, it's gained a lot of popularity because it's a lot easier for companies to filter water as opposed to purify it. Mm-hmm. And so then they can add, Hey, this is mineral water, which is really not a, um, benefit unless it's done in a a controlled method so I, that's kind of a confusing way i've talked about it. let me try to explain that mineral water is not bad for you and if you prefer the taste of having some minerals in your water sure don't get it with just the natural varying hardness that comes from city water Pull all of that out. Start with a clean slate of highly purified water. And if you prefer the way mineral water tastes, because as I've previously explained, the health benefit is 
is just not there. It's negligible. The, the mm-hmm. argument for saying I need mineral water for my health is just not there. Um, but if you like the taste, then run it through a mineral filter after purification. That'll bleed some minerals in for the taste, and you know what those minerals are, uh, and it's not uncontrolled. Now, some people will ask, well, if I drink purified water, will I will it leach minerals from my body because it doesn't have any minerals dissolved into it? Will it pull those from my body? The answer to that is the water would have to be to an entirely next level of purification beyond reverse osmosis. So reverse osmosis, as I said, is the gold standard. It filters most impurities 95 to 99.99%. But you can still measure the purity of reverse osmosis by how conductive the water is. So you run a charge across the water, and anything that's in there that's not H2O, that'll conduct electricity, even if it's just a minuscule amount, that's how you monitor how pure water is. For water to be pure enough that it's going to leach minerals from your body, it would have to be measured in resistivity, meaning it is 100%. There's nothing, nothing dissolved in water, which is very hard to achieve outside of a lab. And so the answer to that question, if any out there are wondering, uh, is no. Purified water is not going to pull the minerals back from your body. Well, that gets us to the question of what do you think about LaCroix, Daniel? <laughs> I uh, I drink it more than I should. <laughs> like probably many of us. And um, yes, so, so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I've, I feel very, very informed. Yeah, just a lot of great information about, you know, water and what we should be concerned about um, or uh, at least educated, right, about what's, what's in our water and, you know, ways that we can improve our health by improving um, our, our water, our intake and more than just what we drink, right? And that's probably what a lot of people don't, you know, recognize, or myself included. It's, you know, it's can be what on your, your you talked about your clothes, your laundry, um, other aspects, you know, appliances um, and such. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in a, a residential context, you've got water touches so much. So it touches any appliance you're using that's got water. It touches all of your dishware, your, your clothing. So on a health perspective, kind of this last few minutes has been talking a lot about your drinking water purification, meaning anything you're going to cook with, make beverages with, coffee, tea, drink a glass of water, ice. A lot of those problems uh, on a purification level um, are only a concern when ingested. When consumed, yeah. So the other big problem with, with water in a home in terms of health concern is the chemicals that have been added. We talked about earlier, you add chlorine and ammonia to make the chloramines and the scale inhibitors and the corrosion inhibitors. So when you are, you know, what we've been talking about with reverse osmosis, that does not treat all of the water in the house. That's isolated to wherever you want to be able to walk up and fill up a glass of water because there's a, there's a few reasons it's hard to produce a large enough volume of truly purified water for the whole house without a great, great expense. And you need a specialized faucet for pure water so that you're not passing it over the copper and brass that's in your home and leaching that back in because you've just pulled all those metals out. You don't want them leaching back in. So on a whole house level, meaning all of your plumbing that's currently in place, your showers, baths, laundry, everything, a health concern is those chemicals that are in the water. And so Reason being, you're in a hot shower, all of your pores are opening up, and you're breathing in all this vaporous, hot chemical air. It's getting into your lungs, and you're absorbing it through your skin, all of the chlorine, chloramines, all these other chemicals. And so, um, kind of to your point of, there's other health issues. Yes, I would say on a whole house level, the chemical content Mm -hmm. is of great concern to the health. And then we talked about softening it at the beginning of the podcast, and... Um, that also is treated on a whole house level, meaning all of your fixtures in the house. So you've got your drinking water. That's wherever you want access to drinking water, your wet bar, your kitchen, wherever. So that's what you're saying that what you, what you're consuming is really what you need the, um, to the highest level, obviously thus treated with reverse osmosis. That's correct. Okay. And then the rest of the water in your house is chemical removal for 
health and quality of life reasons. You're not smelling all those chemicals and you're absorbing them through your skin, breathing them into your lungs. And then water softening so that your skin and hair feel better, uh, better quality of life. And then you're also protecting all of your appliances, dishes, things from those scale buildup that you, you mentioned noticing. Uh, that's all hardness. Yeah, thank you uh, for educating us all. I feel very educated <laughs> on water. And um, and our family, uh, I guess about a year ago, we um, had perfect water come out to our house. And, you know, we decided it was, you know, wise investment for us as a family to, to have a whole house filtration you know system. And so we've very much appreciated you guys and uh, having you guys come out and work with us and, and provide us a healthier home. Well, we appreciate having you as clients. Sure. So Daniel, we, we like to end in uh, the episode here and asking you just a few questions that I ask all my guests. The The first one, uh, since this is a Knoxville uh, focused podcast, is uh, is there anything on your bucket list here in Knoxville, greater East Tennessee area that uh, you're looking to do, like to do, like to explore? Yeah, I think it's a little surprising being that I'm an East Tennessee native and do get out and hike and, and active outdoors, but I've never actually hiked LeConte. And so I guess I would love to do that just awesome. to have had the experience. Great. Yeah, that's a it's a great one. I think I don't know how many ways there are, are to get up LeConte, but you have a lot of options to get up to LeConte. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I've heard. And some of them do seem pretty grueling. And so bucket list, it's kind of a painful bucket list, I guess, but be fun. Yeah, that, that reminds me. It's um, something I love to do. I've never uh, they have what the lodge up at Lacan, um, and I've had um, other um, yeah friends and that have uh, had experience. You know, staying the night up there and yeah. getting uh, the meal served, and everything sounds like That's a really cool. full experience. So, you should check that out if you're getting up on on top. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then what about what's uh, one of your favorite things to do around Knoxville? Oh um, man, yeah. Well, I really enjoy um, I enjoy the mountain biking community. I haven't gotten out as much in the past few months as I like, but I always um, love getting out, going to Imes. And um, uh, so uh, enjoy mountain biking. And I really uh, enjoy the the downtown atmosphere too, going down to Market Square, mm-hmm. uh, getting a meal, catching a movie, um, going to a concert. So well, I guess kind of the basic Knoxville things I'm a fan of. Sure. Well, um, that leads us to the next one, getting a meal. So you have uh... – a favorite place to get a meal, favorite restaurant? I think I do. You know, kind of my go-to comfortable jeans, like going there place would be Balter Beer Works down on uh, Jackson. So I gotcha. I think they got good food, good brews. What do you like to get there? Um, I'm mostly just kind of alternate between their burgers. So they got Tillamook and Beast and the Balter Burgers. So I'm, I'm pretty basic in my food selection, but uh, right. also their Black and Fish Taco is amazing. Yeah. Have you been? I have not. Oh, yeah, it's worth. But I'm getting hungry. It, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely worth checking out. They've got a lot of good options. Awesome. Um, you can send me a check, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'd like to end with, yeah, Dana, what's your best tip for staying healthy for the Stay Healthy Knoxville community? Um, I guess in going maybe with a little bit of today's theme, I would say sure. uh, one tip would be just to keep your mind open for, for maybe blind spots in your health regiment. Maybe something you think, oh, I've got that locked down. I'm, I'm doing good there. And I guess just, just being vigilant to make sure our, things you're interacting with, um, things in your life that uh, you may be missing. That's maybe a stretch. I was trying to work it into today's theme. I would also just say consistency. Um, for me, would be the and drinking pure water. Well, I was I'm one. trying to you know not be so straightforward. <laughs> I'll say but it I for think you. it's got to happen. <laughs> I'll say it for you. Drinking pure water is probably a good one. It's um, a good one to improve your health. Indeed, right. Well, the, Daniel. So you know, we talked about this, this topic of pure water, and this is what you guys do and what you guys specialize in. So. For any listener who's um, interested in, you know, more of, um, you know, potentially you guys helping them out, what's the best way for uh, them to get in contact um, with you and find out a little bit more? Yeah, definitely. So we've got a a website, which is a great kind of first step to start, and it's got a lot of helpful info. We've got a blog area. If you're just looking to do more research on your own, it's the number four, perfectwater.com. And from there, it's very easy to access me or anyone else in the company. Um, but yeah, I would be uh, the the guy to contact if you're interested in saying, man, this sparked my interest or um, 
I wanted to know more about what you said here. You really confused me. I'm just so confused. You need to clarify this point. Uh, you could just reach out to me and we do um, free, you know, in-home consultations, assessments, just to say, let's talk about the options that are available for water filtration because it's not, you know, an all or nothing. You can say, well, I really want to get my drinking water set up first and, mm-hmm. and then look at doing whole house treatment maybe later time or vice versa. And so if, if, if anyone's interested, I would love to come out, check out your home, talk with you a little bit more, understand what you're interested in, and then, um, you know, we just provide those assessments. Gotcha. Awesome. So um, so the best way uh, on the website, you got contact information. Okay, on and- the website, and then my cell phone is 865-803-7562. And, um, yeah, you can just reach me at any time. Awesome. Call or text. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel, for coming out on the episode here, the Stay Healthy Knoxville podcast. Yeah, thank you, John Mark. All right, well, stay healthy, Knoxville. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you for tuning in to the Stay Healthy Knoxville podcast, brought to you by Simply Physio. If your pain is preventing you from staying healthy and active and you'd like to avoid surgery, pain medicine, or just want to get back to doing the things you love in and around Knoxville, we offer both a free ebook and free over the phone consultation to help you figure out the root cause of your pain and the next best steps for resolving it. Find our ebooks online at simplypt.com slash health dash tips. There you will find ebooks for topics such as neck and shoulder pain, lower back and hip pain, knee pain, and TMJ. These quick to read reports will provide you with expert tips, tricks, and exercises to help solve your pain from the comfort of your own home. Just visit simplypt.com slash health dash tips to download your ebook and have it delivered directly to your inbox. We also offer free, no obligation phone consultations with a doctor of physical therapy to Knoxville area residents. Just call us at 865-351-0615 or visit us at simplypt.com and click the talk to a PT button on the home page to schedule a call with us. Thanks again for joining us and we will see you next time on the Stay Healthy Knoxville podcast. Stay humble.